Well, thank you. It, it's fun. Um, you know, one of the things, now I graduated in 77. It was a four-year program, took me five years to do it. Uh, anybody here from Missouri? Okay, good. And it's state tuition in the grade. Um, so I graduated in 77, and the economy was about as bad as you can have it. Uh, lived in Kansas City for a while, and then got an offer to go to work for a firm in San Francisco uh, from a friend of mine who's a K-State graduate. And so we've, I've been out there for 39 years. Uh, put almost nine years at Gensler as a project manager where I learned an awful lot about architecture as a business. And it occurred to me after all my years of going through here, you get a lot of great, and you're already you're getting an excellent education, I want you to know that. But you don't really talk about the business of architecture. I mean, what is it like to, to, to run the business part? And I am the business partner at MBH. M is the business development partner here. So he's outside, I'm inside. B, we fired 19 years ago because he was a lawsuit waiting to happen because he was just abusing the staff. So, uh, and that happened. Uh, there are, so I'll tell you a bit about MBH. Uh, there's, so we've been in business 30 years. We started our business uh, October 2nd, 89, right before the big quake out there. Um, we've been in Alameda the entire time. We went, we like Alameda, it feels like the Midwest. And we, we found a niche that has really served us well. Um, in that we, we do a lot of work for large publicly traded national retailers. Now, in doing that, it's not repetitive work per se, but you're dealing with a lot of the same kit of parts and it allows us with the really good clients to build teams around clients. So like right now we have five different teams that do work or, oh, we do work for Apple. And we got there because of relationships we had in the early years with Gap. Because a lot of what this business is about is building relationships. And ultimately, what we as a business and what you as an individual have to be is a safe choice. Is this person here a safe choice to hire? Do they have the skills, the personality, whatever that I want to have? And, and it's, it's when you position yourself for presentations to clients, they want to find the architect there that's going to be the safe choice for their needs and for the one that's not going to screw up really bad and get them fired down the line. I mean, that's really the reality of it. But a business is much different than just doing the designs. And the designs are absolutely necessary, and we do that. Uh, design is subjective. Anybody find that out yet? I found that out early in my career. Your whole soul is out there, and somebody's picking it apart. It's not really great. What's fun? Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do, because my friend Don is not here, and has four offices based in Kansas City, and my friend Greg, who's not here, and he's based in Topeka, they're not getting work, is we thought it would be really good to just to offer ourselves to talk with you folks for an hour, whatever you want to do, about what the business of, of being in a firm entails. Uh, if the, if the the survey that was published recently in the architectural record is accurate. Only 38% of you are going to go on and work in an architectural firm. I'm not sure why, but you know, everybody has to work. I mean, I couldn't work in a place else but an architectural firm. That's just me. Uh, I, get, I get a great deal of satisfaction in, in being a licensed architect. My son, who uh, Jay referred to, as graduated in 14, was involved in building this. And he's one test away from being my starter. Couldn't be prouder. He sent me a video ten minutes ago. We have a fire in our office. So hopefully it's going to be major, but you know, stuff happens, right? Anyway, so I don't really have an agenda. As I, as I told Jay, if I was going to put a title on this, it'd be no PowerPoint, no bullshit. Let's talk about the business of architecture. So if you're going to be a hardcore designer and you're really, really good, this is probably not going to be that much of but even the designers have to pay attention to the business of the practice. So, shall I ramble? Yes, good. Let's start with a question. So when you decided you want to start an open fire, what was like the first step? The first step, okay. I'm going way back. Mm -hmm. I think the first step in starting your own firm, there's a lot of them, and so the first step is you have to do a, a really strong analysis of yourself as an individual, and only you can do it. 
uh, can I do this? What am I strong at? What am I weak at? What do I need to have a partner who is strong? I'm not a business development guy. So I got McNulty for that. I was not a designer, so we had B for that. Fortunately, we replaced B before we got rid of B. But you got to, you know, can you handle the unknown? Can you handle risk? Do you have enough money? Because you got to have that. I mean, we, went to, we, we were fortunate. We only had to go four months without pay. And we were all married with kids and houses. So then you got to have savings. Yeah, you got to have savings to be able to do that. And it's also more, more expensive now to start an architectural firm because you have to have all that damn hardware and software. All we needed was doors and parallel parts in 1989. So how are you going to pay for it? Where's that going to come from? But the most important thing you have to have is you have to have a client who thinks you're a safe choice. We had that in the Gap. You guys are all too young to remember, but 30 years ago, Gap stores were 25 feet wide in malls and they were orange. But and they had decided to expand. We knew some of the people there because they're based in San Francisco and Youngberg at that time was doing some of the work. Not that we were, but they knew us. And they were embarking on doing large storefront stores back east. And so the first project we did was a small gap kid store in Toronto, which, you know, doing work out of the country is its own little interesting challenge. But our third project, 8903, was a 34,000-square-foot, three-level gap store at 34th and Broadway in New York. And it, was, it, it set the tone for what we were going to be doing for a while. So you know, we worked on that. They were our client. We sent them an invoice every month for about 18 years until they sort of imploded because they didn't know what to sell. But you've got, those are just some of the things you've got to have wise counsel. Uh, because when you go out there, you're going to have to have IT, you're going to have to have insurance, you're going to have to have payroll, accounting. You have to figure out okay, what kind of a company am I setting up? What sort of a corporation am I? My partnership, this or that. So it's important to have wise counsel. You should always seek wise counsel. If, you have, if you've never read the book, it's a great little parable called The Richest Man in Babylon. It's a great little book. I mean, they, another thing they don't teach us in architecture do anything about money. So you've got to understand money. There's contracts, risk, insurance. Uh, do, you want to, do you want to sign up on a contract for some risk that your insurance company will not, will not cover you for? Probably not. There's a lot to learn, so the best place to learn it is in the firm you're in at the time. You get some exposure to that. Um, yes? So would you recommend taking like business classes, a minor in business, or double majoring in business or something? Or I've never had business hired, class. But, yeah. you have, but you do have to know what you don't know. And then you have, like in an architecture, if you don't know, if you know what you don't know, then you have to know who to call to find the answers. But I, I think a business class, I saw architects who took business classes and they rarely stayed in a firm. They would go to large corporations and things like that, which obviously pay much more, but I don't think it's near as heady as being a private practice architect. So I hope most of you stay in the field. But I find it very rewarding, even though I'm not the guy putting buildings together. That was a good question. Yes, sir. So did you start up as a partnership? We started. A lot of the decisions you make as, as an architectural firm or any company are based on tax planning. So we started out as a subchapter S for three months, took the losses on that that we could apply to our own uh, taxes, and then on, on the first of the year, 1990, we went to an S-Corp. I forget the reason why, we were at S-Corp for a long time, then we went to C-Corp, but I mean, you kind of bounce back and forth, because a lot of it comes to tax planning. Uh, we are a C Corp right now because it has advantages. Because my partner John and I are going to be selling uh, a lot of our stock into the, the firm ESOP Trust, which we've been funding for five years. We're going to be doing that later this year. And there's advantages to he and I tax wise by having the firm be a C corporation. Well, what kind of things does each of the partners bring? Well, it's a good question. We started out with the three of us, and um, so we had. Get the work, which is McNulty, Mr. Outside, you know, designed the work, which was B, who then changed his name to A. Uh, and then there was, you know, get get the get paid for the work. That was my job. All that all that sort of infrastructure underneath that. Um, you know something? As you 
you get older sometimes, you have a thought and it just disappears. What was the question? What's the issue of heart? Okay, and that's it. Everybody's got their roles. And, your, and so think of it as circles with a slight amount of intersection. Because you, none of you should be making decisions in a vacuum. Whether it be me as the, as the inside partner or McNulty out there making deals with people that affect the financial aspects of the partners in, in, uh, in the company. Now, over the years, we added uh, a retail partner because we were doing a lot of retail work. We added a housing partner, we were doing a lot of housing. Uh, those two didn't work out long term, and so they're gone. So currently what we have is we have John and I, he's outside, I'm inside. Our controller is a partner because he gave us some valuable uh, knowledge and dedication through 08 and 09 when we almost went bankrupt. We have two partners who pretty much work full time doing things for Apple that I can't talk about. Uh, one of them is also the design principal MBH and he sets the look of the firm. He also is the lead overseeing marketing communications. We have a full person marketing communications. And then I've got four partners that are have various retail work that they oversee. Don DeCumos is the lead uh, partner in charge of retail. He used to be our client in the Gap. Uh, Dimple and Ryan McNulty, John's son, both have uh, luxury retail clients that they oversee. And Rena is my warrior. And who thinks I'm full of crap by saying that? Any of you out here ever come short in high school or college and, and not really have the money to make it to the end of the month? If you have, you know what I'm talking about. We don't just went bankrupt. Yes, Jay? So during the 08, 09, and then downturn in Kanye, how did you weather that storm? And then what are some of the lessons you've learned oh, coming out of it? Oh, <laughs> boy. Good job the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> so 08 and 09. Uh, 2008, we learned that there was a real problem with our work in the middle part of the year. Uh, we were 220 people at the end of 07, between uh, Newport Beach and Alameda. And then, then the sky started falling. Uh, by August 1st, the principals had taken 50% pay cuts, the senior people took 20% pay cuts. All benefits that we had pretty much went away. Um, and we were just struggling to Try to stay afloat, uh, trying, to, trying to hold on to our cash, trying to do nothing that would create harm to the firm financially. So we had, a, we had a project at that time was a Neiman Marcus store in Walnut Creek, California, which is fairly close to our office, probably 15 miles. And we had designed it, we wanted it to be a museum quality, which it is. And then when it came time to put the fee for construction documents, and they had this ridiculous number of what they thought it was going to be. And so we said, no, we can't do it for that, because that would have created financial harm to the company. They found somebody to do it, and unfortunately, those people that did it in are are going to do a great job. But do no harm. So we, uh, we went from 220 people in 07 to 45 in, uh, in the middle of uh, 2009. John and I and our wives uh, met with a bankruptcy attorney who wanted a $150,000 retainer. We uh, negotiated with our landlord to defer uh, $80,000 of rent a month for a while and ended up deferring a million dollars in rent that we paid back uh, because that's what we could afford. And it was to the landlord's uh, benefit to keep us afloat. We renegotiated a whole bunch of things with our banks. John and I put all of our available cash in the company uh, and we just held on and waited. Great. So, in um, August of 2009, uh, my partner John's contact at Apple called and he says, you know, we have a monogamous relationship, right? Everybody know what monogamous is, right? And John said, yeah, we do. He says, well, good. Because Gensler didn't understand that. And they've been working on the new Microsoft store for eight months. We just found that. Allison Brad, no. And so we're going to take those stores and we're going to give them to you. Well, that's good. And then about the same time, uh, 
my partner Andreas, who's the design partner and had been at HOK for 15 years and lots of friendships and relationships, gets a call on a Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock from his friend who's at Apple and says, Andreas, I need you to come to Cupertino now. Have you ever been in the Bay Area? Do you have any idea how long it takes to go to Cupertino from, say, San Francisco on a rush hour on Friday? I mean, it's, it's just painful. So he goes. He goes down there. <coughs> And his friend Russ says, hey, we've got this program, and we've got an architect involved, and, and they're not doing very well, and we'd like for you to have you guys quote it. So Apple has a, has a program called APR, Apple Premium Reseller. It's essentially, it's a franchise program. But it's everywhere but the US. And these are stores that are not very big, and usually they have a different name besides Apple in the front, but there's a little logo outside on the Signing to have a little Apple logo. That's how you know it's a, uh, uh, an APR store. So I went in Helsinki this summer. So I went to Amsterdam. They're all over. We did. It. So we ended up quoting them a fee. We got the work. We had to make a huge investment in hardware and Cinema 4D software. Anybody know Cinema 4D software? It's incredible stuff. It takes a lot of juice to drive. We are second to MTV in software licenses on uh, Cinema 4D. And there's also Revit involved and all kinds of stuff. So since that call, it's been continued. We've done about 4,000 stores overseas. Not the most glamorous, but it's pretty cool for the kids that come right out of school to get to work on for a year or two until they go crazy. This is, you have a week to do a store. And it's, it's essentially full-blown CDs. And that's kind of how they build them, because most countries don't have the same uh, uh, permitting requirement that we do in the US. So out of that, because of the, we were doing a good job for Apple, the relationship grew. And now we've got 15 people designing fixtures and stuff for stores, for wherever Apple products go. We're starting to hire industrial designers now. Didn't see that coming. We have a couple of people who work on what Apple calls black ops projects. And so I got a guy there working, or two people working for him, and we don't know what they're working on, and they can't tell us. But Apple pays their bills every day. So that's what we have to do. Uh, yeah, consistent work. Okay, I'm gonna follow up on that. So when when you shrunk down to, I think you said 45. Yes. For the sake of the students here, can you talk about what qualities you look for in people that you retain and those you let go? That's a great question. So, you know, once you want, at a firm as you grow, you always hire people you regret hiring. And then a little bit of dip and you get rid of them, right? But what do you do when you've got, you've cut all the fat out and you've cut the muscle out and you're going down into the bone? How do you decide who you're going to keep? So what we did, is we put everybody's, at that time, wherever we had, we put everybody's name on an individual card, index card. We put it on this tackable wall that we had, and we said, okay, how small can we get before we can't cover our overhead? And that was 45 people. And then we, and so we, we so first of all, we assumed we were gonna live. And then, who do we need to rebuild from? Well, you can't just rebuild all from management. So you have to get rid of some managers and job captains and things like that. But then you have to have, and this is more speaking to you right now, is you've got to have the right people at that lower level, which we used to call, when I was a young man, drafters, which are now called designers or something else. But you know what I mean, entry-level people who are, say, three years or less. So you have to look at the characteristics of even one of those people, because you have to have, you have, to have multiple skills to be able to do things. Uh, you can't just say, well, this is my job, this is what I do, you know, what can I do extra? And uh, sort of like, anybody who played baseball? You know, or follow baseball, or you know, utility infielders, right? You gotta have people who can play different positions. And so that's what we did, and, we went, and so I was very proud of the fact that, that out of the 45, one of them who kept, who stayed with us, and was voted to stay in, was, was Candace Gaucher who graduated here, and she'd been with us a while, and Candace was working at the Target stores account, which had been 48 people, shrank to five, and she 
and another gal with two drafters at the camps. And I told Camp, I said, I don't know what the hell you're doing. I'm not going to protect you. But whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And she did. She's in New York now. Doing great out there. It, it's architecture in, a, in private practice is a very much a team sport. And, and the running of the practice is getting more and more that way all the time. Uh, I'm having to learn how to basically run the company differently. We hired a, uh, they used to call him efficiency experts. I forget what, what Michael's title is. But he's, he's there to help us do more, faster, more efficient. And if you've ever heard of Trello, or you're starting to use Trello, if you've heard of Agile Design, you're starting to do all that. I'm still learning about it myself. But the whole way that the office works is changing. Did that answer that? So, can you fire somebody? Do you have what it takes to fire somebody if you have your own company? You look them in the eye and say, I'm really sorry. You know, we just don't have a job for you now. Or changing your position and we're going to have to let you go. So if you're going to start your own company, you're going to be able to do that. Okay, what else? We'll go from that here. It's awful quiet back over there, ladies. Yes? Um, so as of right now, since we are students and if we have aspirations to develop a business or even just get higher up in um, an already existing business, what are some tools and tricks that you think we should start working on developing? Okay, good question. Um, see. Most of you will probably be hired to do technical work, you know, picking up red lines initially and things like that. Some of you may be designers, so let's, let's more focus on that because usually designers don't grow up and start their own business by themselves. Sometimes they do. It's important in starting your own business to understand the contracts. As you're coming up on the technical side, as a job captain and a manager, a manager specifically, you're going to have contracts that you're going to your that your team is doing is providing services for. Some a lot of times they're AIA contracts. Sometimes there's they're different hours as a modification of the AIA contract, but it's just based on that. Uh, you have to understand financials because every person there in that office who's, who's billable, has a, has a billing rate. And so you have what's called the burn. You know, you're eating down the fee every day as people put hours against that. And so you've got to continually check and know where you are with respect to the fee. Because if you don't, you wake up someday and you're hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt no way of getting out. But that's not good. That's not good. Uh, you have to be, I think, you should be technically strong. You should know how things go together. You should have uh, a certain amount of construction administration under your belt. Um, you better have some uh, emotional intelligence. Because if you're not, if you don't have it, you're going to have lots of problems. It's important to understand how to read people, your client, your engineer, your staff. I mean, you know what I mean by read people, right? Um, I'm trying to think what I was working on when I was getting ready. Those are the main things. You've got to build up your cash. It's hard, it's hard with a lot of student debt. Okay. Anybody here have any student debt? Yeah. yeah. I had some too. But not, not the magnitude of what I hear is going on now. Uh, so let me speak to that a bit. Student debt and, and doing that. If you start doing work on the side while you're working for an employer, I don't think that's bad, but don't take it on any work that you're going to compete with your employer. And don't use your employer's assets to do that, i.e. your computer, the printer, your software, that kind of stuff. And so it's important if you're going to do work on the side, you better understand a short form agreement. And the fact that you have to sit down with that client or you're doing, say, a house addition or a small building and say, hey, I've got, I can do this, I can do it, I understand how to do it, throw it together. I have no insurance. You need to know that. And they may, you may not be a safe choice, though, but you have to be honest with them. Okay, next question. Unless you want to follow up with more on that. Did that, that answer your question? Yeah. Good. All right. 
who was your first, like preliminary step to save your money? Did you work for a firm for a while and then save money there and go into the funding room? Uh, okay, so my professional life. Um, my first wife and I moved to Kansas City and worked there for three years. She was a greeting card designer for Hallmark and I, after a year, found a job in a small 10-person firm in Kansas City. And that's where I met the guy who ultimately uh, offered me a job with a firm in San Francisco. So we moved out there. Uh, it was a six-person firm. I think they, uh, they bumped me up to 17000 a year. Uh, my first paying job as an architect was $5 a year. It's a different world back then. Um, so it, I worked at this woman's firm. It was a woman owner, one of the few in the country. We worked there for a while, and it became really clear in her mind that our checks clearing was optional. Paycheck clearing was not something that she really worried about. She'd give me the check, and there may or may not be the funds there. So after about four months, I said, Dennis, this is named Dennis also. I said, Dennis, you've got to get the hell out of here. And so about that time, there was a really nice, big article in an interiors magazine about Gensler. And I read that. I thought it would be big. At that time, they were 15 years old, 500 people, five offices, and just doing kick ass stuff. But they seem to have good benefits. It's a good sized office. I didn't know anybody. So if you move to a new area, it's good to be in a large office to meet people. So we went to Gensler, and you know, I'm doing okay there. But I still wasn't making enough to save the money. So what, at some point, the catalyst, you know, my wife points this out to me, the catalyst for me doing work on the side and trying to have more money was the birth of our sunny. Holy shit, I'm going to afford this. Did my wife go work? And so I started, I let it be known from, from some of my friends in the office that I was going to start doing work on the side. If they had anything, that would be great. And that, that led to some work. And I made a point when I got, did the work, did the same way I told the other managers left. Um, and it was good. And then word of mouth, and I did some more stuff. Uh, he didn't see me much for a couple of years. I was out in the summer throwing my house additions, whatever, whatever I could get. But I always made it a point of when I got paid, I put the money in a separate account. And I took some of that money, usually about 5 to 10 percent, and I invested it in architecture books. Some were design, some were technical, some were that I was investing in my future. And all those books went to MBH when we started in practice. So by the time, keep in mind this is 1989. By the time we get to 89, I've got like 35,000 in savings and figuring that we're going to have to live off of savings for six months and, and, and put money into the firm. Each one of the three of us put $5,000 into the firm to start. I'm not sure you could do that now, but that's what we were able to do. Again, it was sawhorses, doors, Borco, parallel bars, you know, you don't go out and buy equipment. You know, we have never bought a copy machine to this day because the technology changes so fast. You rent those. Uh, but that's, that's the way I do it. And then what I try to tell my young staff, once they get out of debt, just remember that 10% of all you earn is yours to keep. That's again from the richest man in Babylon. You've got to decide if that's gross or not. It's like giving to church. You've got to decide if it's gross or not. But you've got to give to yourself first, which means you've got, you can't be out there spending every time you make on frivolous Having experience of working at a small firm and at a very large firm benefited you when you went out on your own? It benefited me that I had a job. Uh, but I learned the most at Gensler. Gensler is very much a business. And their, their financial accounting, they were always kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of light on technical. But the, the great thing about it was, is they gave me opportunities that even our firm doesn't give the industries. I mean, I was a, I was a job captain doing construction administration on a 12-story office building when I was 28. Was I qualified to? But I, they had me doing it. I had a project manager I could ask questions of, and I learned from that. 
And I just kind of went from there. And when I was 30, I was project manager on the 30, no, 23 story office tower in uh, San Francisco, which to this day, I'm proud to say, it's the tallest building that was ever done in San Francisco. Uh, but again, it comes down to if you don't know something, and you know you don't know it, just go find the answer. But getting licensed was really important to me, and I don't know if that uh, picked it up or not. I was licensed when I was 27. I got licensed as fast as I can. I would, I would encourage both genders to do that because once you start getting married and having kids, it's real hard to get licensed. I see it every day in our office. We just had a gal get licensed. She's, uh, she's the head project manager for the APR team. I'm doing all these stores all over the world. She has six people underneath her. She report to her. She's 38 years old with two kids and just got licensed. Do it early when you got the energy. And you also used to work in our building. What else, guys? Y'all? Is it 30 already? I don't think so. Yes? You referenced the distinction between design and business of our function. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about when it is in your personal career and also. Uh, it has. It has. There's been some design projects uh, that we did decide, okay, we're going to invest in seeing this through to the highest possible level. Uh, I didn't appreciate good design and how, how valuable it can be for your marketing and business development. It actually keeps costs down because getting work is damn hard. But if you're known as a good designer, whatever good design is, and whatever matches up with the client's needs, then you can become a safe choice. Awards are good for that. Uh, so we get her some awards and stuff, and some of them are kind of bullshit awards, but gee, it's always nice having awards. You know, you become more of a safe choice. Um, but what, whatever you do, kind of related to your question, which is a really good one, is you never cut back your services in finishing the project. You know, even if you're upside down financially, really bad. If the client's withholding money and you're upside down financially, you don't ever stop providing your service. You stay within your contract, doing what you're obligated to do, even if your client's being an ass. If you'll work it out with them later on, and you may not get every dollar you're after, but you might get 75 cents on the phone. But you always finish it right. And don't give them an opportunity to say, well, hey, you slow down, my, my, my building didn't get done in time, it cost me a lot of money, I'm not gonna pay you in time, and I'm gonna sue you. Because the general contractor's coming after me for a lot of money. Don't want everybody there. Yeah, you can't, you can't walk away from design. But usually designers, usually have a business kind of when they start from a firm. Some don't, but most do. Small practices, going back to the question. If you, if you decide you want to work in, uh, for a small firm, which a lot of people do, they like the idea of working for a small firm. A small practice usually has one or two people who will found the firm. Okay? They didn't, they didn't start the firm, usually, to just run around and, and, and get cool projects for you to design. So they're going to design the projects. You're going to do the ground work. And they're going to they're going to run the practice on how they want to run it, and that may be occasionally your checks don't clear, maybe keeping the raises down, maybe the benefits are different, and then you have to decide if that works for you, for your life. It may work for you. Maybe you know, I know there used to be with the big name firms in New York wouldn't even pay people straight out of college. Richard Meyer's office. I understand that uh, Bjork Ingalls was, was stunned when he found out he had to pay his junior staff. He didn't have to do that. Yeah, so it's it's a little it's a little harder role when you've got a company that's just not a, a, a really good professional corporation. Maybe the best designers in the world, but you know, you want to work for peanuts and maybe have no health care coverage and things like that. You may want to. You may, you may you may think it's working on your resume. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. 
Yes. Do you guys ever go back and do research on the tokens? Or, uh, as far as a, 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 a diligent part of our practice, go back and look at everything I usually. With the retail, I mean, a lot of our projects don't even last 10 years, which is good and bad. Because it means there's a continual amount of work. I mean, one time I had 40 people working full time just doing uh, things to Apple stores because they wanted to make changes. And when they make changes, they make changes to all three or four hundred of them in the flagship the fleet. You know, okay, you know what? Anybody got an Apple Watch? Okay. They had to go through all their stores before they released the Apple Watch and put chargers in the back room for those watches. And so they said, well, let's do that. And hey, Let's put some baby changing stations in there. Let's do that. The latest one is that uh, one of my partners has been calling the building departments for every location that Apple has a store in the U.S. in to make sure that it's okay to put the restroom signs up now to let them, everybody know that, it, that the restroom is not gender specific. I can tell you that there are cities in the South that don't like that. They want men and they want women. But those are some of the things that, uh, that we do. Come on, give me a hard one. Yes? So you say that you said earlier that you couldn't be in any, you couldn't work in any other way to the sense of arms and armor. I couldn't. Right. And so for you, what's, what, what is it about architecture as a business that is different? Good, good question. You know, I was driving around with my dad, because I'm from Columbia, Missouri, and big MU fan in, in many areas, except in the plane Kansas. Um, and uh, that's where I got the bug for architecture, really not understanding what the hell it is. Was that, you know. But I always liked it when, because he loved to drive around town, he still does, except he can't drive, so I drive around town. And he loved to drive by and see the new house housing projects they were doing, new buildings on the new campus, and that's, I love seeing projects go on. And the bigger they are, the more I like them. So, that's, that's where I got to go. And then I'm, I'm a team sport guy, so you get a big enough firm with big enough teams on projects, and it's, you know, everybody's got a role with that team. Um, you know, my son's task and what he's doing now is he's the technical guy for the show, for the Chanel store. So one level below grade three above. The project manager is really, really good at doing uh, luxury retail. We've got a job captain that knows how to do it, and we've got a junior kid out of cap that's just trying to figure it all out. You know, what the hell's going on? But he's really good. Before I leave, he's really good at Revit, and that's how they got the job. Really good at Revit. Is that what you mean by technical stuff? So. Well, that's one of them. I mean, you know. When I was, like you guys, about ready to come out of college, it was still hand drafting. And then it was that way, and the computer started to come in. But now it's Revit. I mean, most of you don't even do AutoCAD. Yeah, it's Revit. So learn as much Revit as you can, and if that's outside of KU and however means, that's a differentiator in getting hired. We have, we, every person we hire, if they're going to be drawing, which is usually you know, a drafter or a job captain, they get a Revit test, a Revit assessment. Because if, if your skills don't match up and you're hired, as opposed to not being hired, that firm has to make an investment in you because you're going to have to spend time that you can't, they can't build for you, and that's the investment you're making. And that could be 40 hours or 400 hours, but there's an investment in getting that person up where they can be a contributing member of the team. The maddening thing as a business owner is when we, when we invest in, in, in the youngsters to do that, and then in two years, they're gone. And that happens to them. It's maddening, but it does. What, or, uh, what uh, 3D modeling software do you, do you guys use and why? We use some SketchUp for, for quick design stuff. We don't use Rhino. We use uh, uh, Revit for some of it early on. Uh, my housing principal now likes to use SketchUp to do some quick studies. Uh, I, I guess that will kind of download into Revit, I don't know. But I think it does. 
and that's what he wants. But uh, SketchUp's good. We really like it. Sometimes you can do enough of it, you can almost create a little video as you run through the space. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to unpack that revenue comment a little bit. Sure. What we're saying here is that earlier, students learn about it, uh, the more difficult it is to get quality design. And so I'm curious from your perspective, from a higher perspective, if you have two generally equivalent applicants, one that wrote really, really well with the other designers, one that wrote really, reasonably well with the other design, long term, Good question. I think it's going to come down to what are we hiring that person to do. If, you know, hopefully, I have, I have two job openings, and I hire the strong graphic person to be on the one team, and the more design-oriented person to be with a, with a client who may actually have some design opportunities. It's, it's role playing. It's trying to get the skill set to match um, your needs. What you don't want to be is it's a sports metaphor. You don't want to be the best goalie on a softball. But yeah, you just have to match the skills. But uh, you know, uh, my design partner, he designs and runs. A lot of that is, that I, I, I think if you get them in too early, they don't learn how to design. I, I think that's a good point. Is that, but before they graduate, so, yeah, uh, it is a valuable tool. It, it, it is the marketplace. But you have to know how to design and have to have how to think through. Why am I designing what I'm designing? Because that's invaluable. We, you know, we're architects. We solve problems. We, we're, clients hire us to solve their problems and realize their dreams. So we have to do that. And you know, there's some clients that don't care. I mean, you know, if you're doing a doing a building for a guy to pack to, to park his, his tractor and his SUV in and, and whatever, it probably doesn't matter. But uh, most projects matter. We we as architects can make them better, even the most utilitarian type of projects can be better.